the International Trade Union Confederation represents 175 million workers around the world and we are the global labour movement made up of the peak bodies like the AFL-CIO. Now, the global economy is something you're asked to weigh in on pretty often and you were recently at the G20. We hear a lot about recovery. What state are we actually in for workers? We are not in recovery. We're in a very bleak environment. And uh, the small uh, bottoming out, small increase in the, de in the developed economies that we are seeing is actually uh, not uh, acknowledging now the emerging disaster in the BRICS countries with growth in places like Brazil now down to a projected 2.5%, uh, a percentage or two coming off all of the Asia Pacific countries, China, Indonesia, the big economies, India, and they've been seen to be uh, the economies that might pick up some of the downturn in the developed economies and balance out a more global uh, recovery. It's not happening. Now, while um, Wall Street looks at the global economy and sees increased revenues through globalization, um, going to where the workers are cheaper and the labor force is cheaper, uh, workers often see their international colleagues as a threat, as competition. How do you confront that? How do you deal with that when people in a country like this one say, those developing world countries, those emerging economies are taking our jobs? Well, Wall Street sees profits. They don't see people. And sadly, the corporations now responsible for exploitative global supply chains have not understood that this is not sustainable. People will rise up. People will say, it's inhuman. You can't continue to build a global economy on this basis. Frankly, American workers won't find jobs if the workers in China and Indonesia and India don't have well-paid jobs, that's creating an upswing in global demand. If you are basing everything on an exploitative global supply chain model, all you get is what we see now. More and more profit to the 1%, less and less opportunity for the 99%. What say does Labor really have in trade policy? Take this Trans-Pacific Partnership that we're hearing about in this country workers certainly have no idea what's in it. Well, it's not just about trade policy, and I'll come to that. But first of all, if every worker in the world has social protection, a minimum wage on which they can live, the right to bargain collectively, and labour laws that protect them from abuse with genuine compliance mechanisms, then you have a foundation on which you can build genuine competition. Mm -hmm. Now, if that was the global trade environment, we would say, let's look at what it takes to get free trade ready, what's the skills base, what is the innovative capacity, where do you need industry policy, what are the strengths of an economy, all the things we know that help to build economies. But what you've got now is none of that. You don't have competition and trade agreements based on genuine capacity and uh, capacity to produce at quality, at cost and so on. You have trade agreements that are based on an exploitative model. So you first of all have to get the global fundamentals right. Yeah. So ILO core labour standards first and foremost protect a floor of decency and respect. Add social protection and the commitment of the world's leaders to a social protection floor when 75% of the world's people have no social protection. That's got to be in the mix and right now while the G20, the UN, the ILO, the uh, IMF, the World Bank, all of them agree that social protection floor is essential none of them are willing to contribute to paying for the poorest countries to kickstart those systems. Even though long term, it's actually in everybody's interest. So, but what strength do you have to force any of that? I mean, you're in the unenviable position of, as you just described it, the workforce are in a more vulnerable state than ever, and they need more change than ever. How do you make it come about? Actually, I'm not uh, pessimistic about our capacity. If you look at Indonesia, they have not only actually fought back some of the worst of contract labour, but in fact they are building a new set of evidence around minimum wages, the basket of evidence on which minimum wage uh, commissions can make decisions. They've, they've seen a minimum wage increase of 40% in just the last year. If you go to China, not in our movement, but with who we have a critical engagement, then they are rolling out social protection and collective bargaining not as mature as Western agreements yet, but at a rate of knots. Yeah. And their 
pension funds, which also include uh, occupational health and safety insurance and indeed health, they will generate as much as all the pension funds in the world, some 20 to 30 trillion within 20 years or so. So workers hold real power in the economy. We have $25 trillion of workers' capital vested in the global economy. We want it out of speculative capital into patient capital, into real investment in the real economy. And that has to be on the basis of both uh, climate risk and uh, fundamental or core labour standards. We have power and we're going to build more power. No politician, no politician can think they can get elected unless they see the interests of people. And no business leader or speculative investor should think that they are free just to rip off the labour of workers anywhere in the world at exploitative uh, cost and indeed in terrible conditions without actually coming mm. under genuine fire from the community. So is there some strength as well as some weakness in the fact that the worker of today not only shares experiences with people around the world, but as the president of the AFL said at the convention, um, sometimes shares the same employer? We absolutely do share the same employers. And sadly, we're seeing workers uh, exploited off the back of the American corporate model. There's been a long-term struggle between the American corporate model, which is about is anti-union, anti-collective bargaining, uh, you know, uh, push the cost down at all, uh, at all uh, levels, and the European corporate model, which has always been about balancing the social interests with the corporate profits. And you're seeing that again today in Bangladesh. The trade unions, after the terrible fires in Bangladesh, with uh, two of our industrial sectors, industrial and uni, forced a collective agreement with the European brands around shared responsibility for fixing fire safety, for looking at other issues. We fought with the Bangladeshi government to improve the labour laws. Not there yet, but we've got one or two steps in place. The American government came in behind us and put trade sanctions on until we get those laws right. What did the American companies do? They stayed out, they're using PR, they don't want to accept responsibility for anything, mm. no matter what the situation is. And I say frankly to their CEOs, would you let your son or daughter work in those conditions? They say no. We have to see some responsibility, some sanity back into the American corporate model. And frankly, that will take our organising capacity, it will take our global consuming consumer campaigns with allies, and it will take the pressure of our own capacity to drive our investment into decent patient capital.